Dr. Marshall, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. And now let me welcome our next guest, next speaker, who is Dr. Ralph Yeager from Incrinovo LLC. Welcome. Thank you very much. So already we heard a lot of very fascinating talks about the health implication of uh, creatine supplementation. And creatine is the uh, most researched and the most effective ingredient in sports nutrition next to protein. Creatine monohydrate has been around for more than 30 years and companies in the past have tried to improve upon creatine monohydrate, try to develop new forms of creatine with the hope of developing something that is better than creatine monohydrate. In 2011, we published a review of new forms of creatine. The goal of the review was basically trying to look up what is out there, is what is out there safe, has it been clinically validated to be effective, and how does it stack up against creatine monohydrate. And 10 years ago, we didn't find any evidence of any ingredient being better than creatine monohydrate. In preparation of this conference, we actually took another look at the data out there. So there's an updated version published actually just a month ago, uh, doing the same thing, looking at the new forms of creatine that are out there and basically try to figure out if those are more or less effective than creatine monohydrate or if creatine monohydrate is still the king of the castle. To better understand on how we looked at that, uh, obviously it's important to understand the educational background. I'm actually a chemist by education. So I grew up in, in Germany and studied organic chemistry at the University of Bonn. After that, actually, I moved uh, to uh, Caltech uh, and uh, studied bioorganic chemistry. Uh, I uh, tried to develop new uh, drugs for breast cancer research. And then actually after Caltech, I started my first job. And my first job actually was with a company called SKW. Uh, which uh, has uh, for, since then became uh, Degussa and is now uh, Alschem. Uh, so my first job actually was as head of a laboratory at SKW and I had three annual goals when I started my, my, my job there. The first one was actually try to stabilize creatine in water because creatine has limited the stability in any kind of liquids. So my goal was to actually stabilize creatine. The second goal was trying to find a better form of creatine, a form that is better than monohydrate. And the third one actually was trying to find new health applications. And uh, if, if back then I knew what we knew now, I'm not sure if I actually would have taken the job because to actually stabilize creatine or to find a better form of creatine is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Obviously what COVID has done to us actually is, is we see a lot of changes. We see a lot of changes in the way we work out. And uh, I always would like to highlight the Chinese symbol for uh, crisis, which actually uh, consists of two different symbols of danger and opportunity. So whenever we basically have a crisis, there is danger to, uh, uh, to us, but also there's an opportunity to, to grow out of the crisis even stronger than we went into it. What actually happened is that the, due to the pandemic, 22% of the gyms in the US actually have closed and the more than $30 billion was lost in revenues. The, the big change actually have survived. They're gonna be around. And today, the number of, of gyms is basically the same level as in 2019. We expect a massive rebound uh, for the number of gyms out there for, for this year. And obviously this has an impact on sports nutrition because the, the brands that were selling mainly through gyms suffered as much as actually the gyms themselves did. But also there's something good coming out of this crisis. And that actually is that the percentage of the general population who believes that exercise is actually helpful to maintain, maintain health has increased significantly. So as of today, 60% of the population thinks that you can actually improve your health through exercise. And that is an increase from 53% back in 2006. Also the one thing for sure is that sports nutrition is one of the fastest changing uh, market within the dietary supplement field. Uh, what consumers are looking for changes all the time. And uh, here's just an example of, of what is going on, just the, the body positivity movement. In the past, getting a six pack was extremely important to a lot of people. That actually is, is no longer the, the key. The key actually is health. 
And as I said earlier, basically we work out to actually improve our overall health and not necessarily to get actually a six pack these days. Also the uh, sports nutrition market actually uh, grew a lot by the addition of uh, what is called the active nutrition market. So people overall work out more than they did uh, in 2006. So uh, now 3.4 days on average compared to 2.7. So that obviously is excellent. The, the way the market is actually separated between sports and active nutrition is by the amount of times people work out. So sports nutrition, people work out five times uh, per week for 20 minutes or more. Active nutrition is three to four times. And what is important obviously is that we wanna look at what kind of supplements people are using that depends on, on their goals. And we're looking at sports nutrition. What we can actually see here is this is the kind of supplements people that work out five times or more are using. And to me actually surprisingly and a little shockingly only 21% of those actually use creatine. Creatine is if not the most effective one but only very few people actually take it. And if we're going on to active nutrition, so those are the people that work out three to four times a week, you don't even find creatine on this list anymore, which again is shocking based on the activity and what creatine actually can do for you. So what is wrong with creatine monohydrate? And if we are looking through the potential uh, problems with, with creatine, there are few. Uh, the first one, this is uh, consumer convenience, is that there's a loading required. So there is no acute effect to creatine supplementation when it comes to sports. So you have to actually increase the creatine content in the muscle. And therefore you have to take creatine uh, for a certain period of time, either through a loading phase where you take higher amounts for shorter periods of time, or you're taking a lower amount for longer periods of time. Another potential problem with creatine uh, is weight gain. What we actually know is that when creatine gets transported into the muscle, also sodium gets dragged into the, the muscle and the sodium drags water with it. So what we see to a person who actually uh, uh, increases their muscle creatine content is that we see an increase in, in water too. So therefore there's a weight gain. And obviously the weight gain and, and the increase of hydration in the cells could be part of the mechanism of creatine because the, the cell swelling induces muscle protein synthesis. But this is an unwanted effect for quite a few and specifically with the female population. So uh, there's a, a great reluctancy of, of females taking creatine because of the uh, weight gain. Creatine also has uh, a non-responder. So there's a certain amount of people that do not increase creatine content as the others do. Creatine has limited solubility, uh, limited stability in liquids and you have to take uh, a larger amount. So a standard serving size is around five grams. Five grams is hard to be uh, put into a capsule or into a, a gummy or, or more convenient serving formats that are used by consumers. So that, that's another downside. So we actually have quite a few things on how we could improve creatine monohydrate and the industry and, and, and the companies out there basically were looking at those limitations and try to develop new forms of creatine that would overcome the shortcomings of creatine monohydrate. When we did the research, we actually found 88 creatine related compounds in PubMed. So there's a huge amount of creatine ingredients out there. But the question obviously is, how many of those are really clinically substantiated? How many actually have safety data? How many of those are regulatory compliant? And is any of these any better than creatine monohydrate? When we're looking at the stability of creatine in liquid, actually creatine is not stable in solution due to an intramolecular cyclization from creatine to creatinine. The speed of the degradation, so how fast that occurs depends on pH, so the lower the pH, the faster the degradation and on temperature. So the higher the temperature, the faster the degradation. So with lower pHs, and you can actually see at pH 3.5, so there's a significant degradation within just uh, 72 hours. 
so what's going to happen actually if you consume creatine and it goes into your stomach? The stomach is a very acidic condition. So therefore, is there any creatine even being taken up because if it breaks down at low pH, what actually happens? Luckily, actually for us in this case is that while the stability actually gets worse, the lower the pH, there's a certain pH level where the degradation just stops. And that has to do with the chemical structure of creatine. So at pH levels of less than 2.5, the degradation of creatine in the creatinine stops because uh, the, the molecule gets protonated and therefore I'm blocking that reaction. The same is true with the extremely high pH levels, where again, I basically prevent the, the degradation of the creatinine uh, due to deprotonation in this case. So therefore, luckily for us, creatine under uh, stomach conditions is perfectly stable because you no longer have uh, the breakdown of the creatinine because of this extremely low pH level. So we're looking at different creatine products out there. And uh, we, back then we tried a lot of different things trying to stabilize creatine and liquids and, and pretty much failed with everything. While our definition of having a stable form of creatine means that there are no detectable amounts of creatinine. If you are not that lenient about your definition of what stable is, you obviously can uh, have creatine products that have some amounts of creatine in there, but also higher amounts of creatinine. But for us, basically back then, that was always not acceptable. So we actually were successfully able to transfer creatine from just supplementation, but also into the cosmetic industry. And the question obviously is, how can you create a, a, an emulsion, a cream, because that's still a liquid system with creatine. And if you're looking again, how creatine uh, breaks down into creatinine, what do you actually see that this is an equilibrium. So therefore certain amounts of creatine go into creatinine and also the reaction goes the other way around. It goes back from creatinine to creatine. So there's a certain ratio. At that point, basically the, uh, the amounts of creatine and creatinine don't change anymore because it's basically at that fixed ratio. So the way you create a stable creatine cream is simply by adding creatinine. Because again, if you're adding creatinine already to it, the amount of creatine basically is stabilized because you are at that equilibrium. While we can do this for, uh, for cosmetics, and this uh, product that you see here, the Q10 power, actually is a combination of Q10 and creatine. So creatine is, is widely used in cosmetic applications. While this is something we can do for cosmetics, we cannot do that for uh, oral supplementation because we cannot feed a human being that much cre creatinine at the same time. So one of the, the ways that it can be done actually is by separating the creatine from the beverage until the time of consumption. And the picture here, you see actually a system where you would protect the creatine in, inside a, a plastic container. And if you open the beverage can, then basically the creatine is released into the beverage so therefore it's perfectly stable uh, during the, the shelf life of the, the beverage because it's separated from the water. In the past, there were always some companies claiming that they found the holy grail. They found a way to stabilize creatine in water. And one of the uh, most famous examples actually was Muscle Marketing uh, USA's uh, creatine serum. They basically claim that they have a safer and more effective form of creatine, more effective than creatine monohydrate powder. However, Dr. Kreider did a very impressive study on this ingredient and basically found, first of all, there is no significant uptake of creatine into the plasma. And second, if you actually uh, supplement it chronically, there is no increase in muscle creatine content, simply for the reason that basically this product lacks uh, significant amounts of creatine to be effective to actually increase the, the creatine content. So this is an example of uh, a product that claims to have solved the problem, but it clearly has not. Another ingredient that we uh, uh, looked at is crealkaline. And crealkaline basically uses high pH to potentially stabilize creatine. Uh, they also made claims that the crealkaline is better than creatine monohydrate, 
but uh, a very impressive study actually compared the crealkaline and creatine monohydrate directly. And the study showed that the, when it comes to muscle creatine content, to uh, fat-free mass or to performance, that crealkaline does not outperform creatine monohydrate. So therefore uh, it's not superior to creatine monohydrate in this uh, controlled study. Another example that looked at trying to stabilize creatine in a liquid actually is something called supercreatine. Uh, however, supercreatine actually is uh, an amide, so it's covalently bond creatine to leucine. And by that, it's no longer creatine. So this molecule, supercreatine, is not creatine because the creatine molecule has been modified by creating a covalent bond. And uh, what is lacking at this point is basically data showing that if you are ingesting and uh, there, are, there are doubts about that because the, the company marketing this ingredient has a similar molecule, a combination of creatine and glutamine. And in their own data, they basically show that it does not dissociate completely. So therefore, um, there is significant doubts if uh, this form of, of creatine, well, again, it is not creatine, but if this new molecule actually would release creatine to a similar level of monohydrate, or basically then subsequently will increase muscle creatine content and show increased performance. And at this point, we actually have a published animal study showing that the creatine monohydrate by far outperforms this form of creatine when it comes to increasing muscle creatine content. Creatine solubility. So we're looking at the solubility of creatine. Uh, actually, we can increase the solubility by decreasing the pH or by increasing the temperature. If you're looking at the numbers actually uh, on solubility, you see that temperature and pH have a significant uh, in effect on the total amount of creatine that uh, actually dissolves. So therefore, if you uh, uh, heard the, uh, the, the all the recommendations on how to consume creatine, I basically said the best ways to do that is either to, to pour it into orange juice Orange juice is acidic, so therefore using the pH as a tool to increase solubility. The other recommendation was to steer it into a hot tea. Hot tea obviously has the increase in temperature. So those old recommendations, either steer it into orange juice or steer it into hot tea, uh, basically reflect the effect that the solubility of, of creatine increases with temperature and increases with a lower pH. Creatine actually is a weak base, so it can form salts with uh, strong acids. And uh, why this is of interest is because if you would put the creatine salt back into a glass of water, you basically have creatine and acid. As a consequence, you have a lower pH. So by having a creatine salt, and you put that into a glass of water, you basically have a low pH condition, and therefore you have increased solubility of creatine. <laughs> Creatine salts actually dissociate in, uh, in your stomach during digestion. And uh, studies looking at creatine plasma levels actually showed that if you are ingesting uh, either creatine citrate or creatine pyruvate, for example, that you uh, see a significant increase in creatine levels. And when you actually compare them to creatine monohydrate and you compare isomolar amounts, so the same amounts of creatine, you can actually see that the peak values actually are uh, even higher with the creatine salts. However, there is no muscle biopsy study available, so we don't know if the higher levels in the plasma would translate into higher levels in the muscle. And we also don't know basically if those small changes actually would then later on translate into a greater creatine retention or actually any kind of performance benefit. What I wanted to highlight too is that when we're looking at plasma levels, there are a lot of companies out there doing a quick absorption study, meaning they're looking at creatine content in plasma. And they basically showed that they have more creatine in the system compared to monohydrate. And they claim that they have a better form. And I just wanted to highlight that the only thing they have shown is that it's different. You cannot judge if it's actually better or worse because for that, 
you would have to take a look into the muscle. And I wanted to show this one example. We know that co-administering creatine with large amount of carbohydrates induces an insulin spike. Insulin spike gets more creatine into the muscle. So we have better creatine retention by combining creatine with the high amounts of sugar. And we're looking at plasma levels of creatine co-administered with carbohydrates. What we basically see here is that we have less creatine in the plasma. So less actually means in this case that creatine is absorbed faster from the plasma into the target tissue, which is the muscle. So in this case, actually lower plasma concentrations are an indicator of an improved absorption. So just to keep that in mind that whenever you look at plasma data, it's an indicator of something is different, but you cannot judge if it's better or worse. Creatine nitrate is another example of a creatine salt that is out there. For uh, this salt, actually, uh, Dr. Kreider did a study. So there's data available on muscle creatine content. And again, this study showed that the creatine nitrate is by no means superior to creatine monohydrate. Actually, creatine monohydrate in this case showed greater creatine content in the muscle. However, creatine salts contain creatine. And as long as they are creatine and this uh, creatine is bioavailable, you will see a performance benefit if you dose it correctly. And I wanted to show a couple of examples of studies that we did in the past on creatine pyruvate and creatine citrate. This actually is a study looking at intermittent hand grip exercise. And uh, what you basically see here is that if you're supplementing with the creatine, five grams for four weeks, you can actually see a significant improvement in power. You see a significant improvement in contraction velocity. So creatine citrate and creatine pyruvate work. You see a performance benefit. But the study did not look at monohydrate at the same time. And I would assume that monohydrate would also show this performance benefit. And there would be no difference between those two uh, assaults compared to the monohydrate. Another example, again, creatine pyruvate. This is a study in, in elite athletes uh, looking at the Finnish Olympic team and in a canoeing exercise and actually supplementation with creatine pyruvate significantly improved race times in this clinical study. So again, showing that creatine salts are effective and they are effective because they contain a bioavailable form of creatine. So they work because they contain creatine. When we're looking at the regulatory aspect of different forms of creatine, we actually uh, know that creatine monohydrate was already introduced to the market uh, before October 94. So it's an old dietary ingredient. Creatine monohydrate, uh, the, the Crea Pure brand by Alzchem is actually also FDA grass. So we can actually use the creatine in food products. Other than FDA grass, there's self-affirmed grass. So this is uh, uh, basically grass process not run through the FDA. And uh, companies that do that, they usually write press releases and those press releases are collected in a database. So you can basically look up uh, who has actually achieved self-affirmed grass. And there's a form of creatine with magnesium that actually has self-affirmed grass. The other way to register an ingredient is the new dietary ingredient notification with the FDA. So those are again, are public. And if you look into the NDI database, you can actually see that two of those new forms of creatine, two creatine salts actually have a positive new dietary ingredient notification. This is creatine pyruvate at five to 10 grams a day. And the second one is creatine nitrate, but that one only at 750 milligrams. So at a relatively low dose per day. And that is depending on the safety of, of nitrate, obviously. The other ones that have been applied actually have been objected by the, uh, by the FDA. So most of the creatine forms that actually have applied for an NDI status have been rejected. The two that actually passed the FDA is creatine pyruvate and creatine nitrate at this point. Obviously, when it comes to regulatory, there's a lot of room for interpretation. Do you even have to file an, an NDI for a creatine salt? Because if you are ingesting it, it's going to be completely dissociated. So therefore, you shouldn't even have to file one to start with. So there are 
basically certain certain ways to, to look at regulatory. But from what is available in the public domain, we have creatine monohydrate as an old dietary ingredient with an FDA grass status, creatine with magnesium as a self-affirmed grass, and then creatine pyruvate and uh, small doses creatine nitrate as a new dietary ingredient. So the review basically concluded that creatine monohydrate is still king of the castle. There are certain innovations around creatine monohydrate that make technically sense. Creatine salts make sense because you improve solubility. Does improved solubility automatically mean that you have greater bioavailability, greater absorption into the muscle, greater performance? No, it does not. So we don't have the data to actually make that conclusion. But still, improvement through improvement of technical uh, abilities of creatine. So we have some of the ingredients out there, the creatine pyruvate, citrate, the HCL, so those creatine salts that actually have independent studies proving that they are effective. Uh, we failed to find any comparative studies of any of those new forms of uh, uh, ingredients directly with creatine monohydrate and a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study showing significant benefits of those new forms over creatine monohydrate. So that simply at this point still doesn't exist. So creatine monohydrate is, is still the king. So in conclusion, creatine monohydrate is awesome. It's very effective. Uh, new forms of creatine uh, still have not reached the same level of safety data or efficacy data uh, than monohydrate. So therefore the conclusion of the, the review was the same as it was 10 years ago, that at this point, Creatine monohydrate seems to be the best form of creatine that actually is available. Thank you everyone for your attention.